it is time for Talking Pints, which, of course, as you well know, is my favourite time of the day. And I'm joined by, well, what do I call you? A veteran broadcaster, <laughs> author. I mean that very nicely, Sue Cook. Welcome oh, well, to, to the programme. Very Thank nice. You. Nice glass of rosé. To see it. Very good. Mm. And she does watch the show. So there you are. Exactly. We must be getting something right. Now, 1974, you start broadcasting the birth <laughs> of commercial radio. It was terribly exciting, yeah, it, it really was. Yes. Because before that, I mean, radio outside the BBC was ships in the North Sea, wasn't it? That's right, yeah, and uh, being buzzed by aircraft and things. And yeah, it was, it was, being... it was pirate, yeah, pirate radio, radio and illegal. suddenly... Illegal. Under the pillow, fading in and out. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I used to listen yeah. to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then you get poached by the BBC and suddenly, within a very short space of time, you know, you are doing... Very, very big program. I, I could hardly believe it. That's the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing as a broadcaster. I was quite quiet, really? not very extrovert, shy, you know. My family were amazing. That's Susan on the television. I can't believe that's my auntie Ivan <laughs> used to say. <laughs> <laughs> but you did a mixture over all these long years of radio, of television. Yeah. What I found really interesting was you know, here we were, the mid nineteen seventies. And what do we have? Inflation very high. Interest rates rising very rapidly. Cost of livings crisis. Um, people's savings evaporating. Slightly familiar. Before the very <laughs> eyes, and here we yes. are, many years on. Um, but for many, many people, they've never seen this before. Mm. For many, many people, you know, anybody under 50 has got no memories of any yeah. of this stuff happening. Did you feel, you know, doing what you did, that you were able to help people through that period. I think that was what motivated me, was feeling useful, you know, doing something. Um, I mean, uh, things would go up a, a penny, two pennies, five pennies of pence a day. Yeah. Um, and it meant a lot to people, you know, a jar of coffee would be suddenly five pence more than it was yesterday. And, you know, you could actually save a lot of money by buying different vegetables or different fruit and different fish. I used to have to go, when I was at Capital, they started this super savers idea. Um, and I had to go to Billingsgate and I had to get up at four in the morning. Yeah. Yep. And I went to Billingsgate and uh, looked and see what catches were coming off the boats yep. and what seemed to be a good a good catch. Mackerel was suddenly loads of mackerel, so that was yep. going to be a good buy, or loads of coley or something. And then I went on to uh, Covent Garden, which it was then, for the mm. veg market. Mm. Luckily, they were all reasonably close together. And see what um, what things were coming in from the lorries and the, the planes and things there. And then I'd go on to Smithfield, the meat market, which was my least favourite, really, but, and then find out what seemed to be good there. So I, I did. I got up at four in the morning for the first four days, but I made sure I talked to somebody <laughs> reliable at each market. So, look, can I ring you at six o'clock in the morning? And, 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 you, and you sort of developed this idea of 30 yeah, products that were in the basket. Decided, because it was yeah. entirely because of that financial climate that yeah. I, my career took off because consumerism suddenly was really important, you know, saving people money. So the BBC poached me. They were going to set up this uh, BBC shopping basket with 30 basic mm. items mm. in it. I can't remember what they all were now. Um, and uh, I would do a bulletin on the price movements. I'd get press releases from the supermarkets to give them, you know, people their special offers from the different things. Um, so I used to do that on you and yours yeah. on Thursdays. Yeah. To a massive audience. Yes, yes. I mean, these, the, people would kill for audiences. You could get those days. But, well, I'm going to talk about broadcasting and how it's changed <laughs> yes, in a moment. Yeah. But I've been thinking about this over the last month. Those families that were confronting this in the 70s, and predominantly women, because yeah, they were running the households. Yeah. I mean, they just were. That's the way it was, yeah. like it or not. Yeah. But these were women who had lived through at least one war, and in many cases, two. They were used to hardship. They were used to rationing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And they pretty much just got on with it. Absolutely. You kept breathing. You kept carrying on, and you know. And people cut back, and I know yeah. people moaned about it. And But it, this is coming as a heck of a shock today, mm. isn't it? Because I think, I can't really remember, but even in those days, we didn't, fridges were reasonably new, weren't they? I don't think people mm. had massive fridges and freezers. So people did cook fresh vegetables. You know, my mother, I seem to remember, would go shopping two or three or four times a week. I'd get sent down with a little list of three yeah. pounds of potatoes, two pounds of carrots, whatever. And there would be fresh food on the, on the table, which is much cheaper than buying processed food and things, everything from supermarkets. Everything was yeah. little I local just, shops. I, I just think there are a lot of people today less well-equipped 
yeah. to deal with hardship and very, very difficult situations. Mm. Yeah. You know, now obviously you went on. I mean, you know, one of the ultimate big programs you did was Crime Watch, which became just massive, didn't it? Yes, I was a bit nervous about it to start with because I'd been doing a program called Out of Court for BBC Two, where we were talking about miscarriages of justice and where the police had behaved badly and where judges had been idiots and you know the, the legal system was was ludicrous. And then you swap sides. <laughs> swap sides. <laughs> so the joke was that I'd be sort of letting people out on, on Out of Court and then putting them back in jail on Crime Watch. <laughs> so, but, Why did Crime? Why was Crime Watch so huge? I suppose um, people were fascinated by crime. I mean, I must say, when I was younger, my father had um, a radio with, with complicated radio. They got all sorts of channels, and I used to love trying to find the police channels and listen to whether there was, you know, some drama going on yeah. up the road. I think people have always been fascinated by the drama of crime and the drama of real life crime. And in those days, we did we made it very real. We didn't have music and we didn't um, fabricate dialogue that might have happened in the reconstructions. It was just a straight mid, mid um, close up where you told people the straight story of what had happened. No adjectives. I never wanted to sort of build it up into something dramatic. But I think less is more. If you start adding adjectives, you know, you begin to think, well, maybe they need to exaggerate. So um, and also I was worried about violence or and normalizing violent crime. So I really sort of yeah. held it back. And but I all, think it just, it worked. Well, it, was, it, it did work. Mm. But all those years, all those years, your broadcasting, big radio shows, big TV shows, big audiences, which of the mediums did you prefer? Radio, I think. Radio. Although... The nice thing about television is the team. I really loved working as a team. Everybody's got their role, and um, you know it wouldn't happen without any of the individual people there. Not quite such big teams these days as, as they used to be. You know, every every camera had at least two people on them, and there were floor managers and assistant floor managers. It was a whole crowd of people, whereas it's, this is a bit bit more minimal now. But but I so I did enjoy that aspect. But there's something very nice about radio and being direct, and you know yeah. you're talking to one person. I was that brought was the Terry up. Wogan thing, wasn't it, that, that, that when Terry Wogan was asked on one of the chat shows about this huge eight million audience or whatever yeah. it was, he was like, how big is your audience, Terry, you know, and he said one person. I didn't see that, but that, that's And he felt he right. was talking to one person. Mm. Well, what we're trying to do here at GB News hasn't really been done before, because this is television, but it's going out, as you and I speak, on yeah. DAB radio in people's cars yeah. as well, so... And it's live, and you feel and you are live. talking to people now, which I love. Yeah, and so when I showed the pictures of Sleepy Joe unable to get his jacket on right. and then not remembering he'd just shaken Huber's <laughs> hand, I sort of talked over it, trying to do both at the same time. But broadcasting is changing quite quickly mm. with streaming, with a multitude of channels, with paid-for options, with... I mean, the BBC, you know, I talked a moment ago about five o'clock on a Saturday and, and it seems to me they get rid of some of the things that really are cherished and loved yeah. and, I, and I, I sort of wonder where that comes from but and the BBC politically I would argue through the ref well after the referendum particularly is not I don't think it's covered itself in glory mm -hmm. what is what is the future of the license fee the BBC where does all this go so well I think it's, sadly it's not looking very good I mean it was an absolute national institution and a huge treasure um, and I think they still do some good dramas although not quite as good as they used to be and the, you know you can see all the woke boxes being ticked can't you <laughs> as the cast comes on <laughs> um, and the foreign correspondence is is still second to None. and people like Frank Gardner and Jeremy Bowen and all of and they, they are you know wonderful but I think the news gathering is um, really quite shameful and the questioning I don't I, they don't seem to want to question anything shameful it's quite a strong word well yeah it is shameful I, I throughout the lockdown did anybody ever ask why what's happening to children how are children going to be affected if you're closing down schools how are, you, are university students going to be affected if you're shutting down all the universities? What are these people going to do? Kids wandering around the streets. You know, have you not thought about... I mean, the kids' knife, knife crime went up. But were there, was there any journalism about that? Did anybody test the PCR tests or test the lateral flow tests and the, the fact that different laboratories had different standards for them? And, you know, we were basing all our policy on that and it was very unreliable. Where was the BBC, for goodness sake? I mean, in my day, we'd have been out there, you know, we'd have, we'd have done investigations and found out the truth. But they didn't seem to want to do that. They were so frightened about 
you know, being contra to the narrative and maybe, you know, the only thing that mattered was COVID, people not getting COVID if possible, mm. which was never going to happen. I think a virus does what it, a virus does. You know, and and in the end. wears itself out and yes. mutates that's and changes. No, no, no. I mean, that's a, that is a very strong criticism of it. So of all these new channels, I mean, are we going to finish up, do you think, having to pay for everything we watch or will it, or will it be a hybrid of free to wear. Where are we going with all this? I don't this? know. I think it might have to be a hybrid. It is a shame because the BBC's licence fee is £159, I think, isn't it? Mm. Which is incredibly cheap. I mean, I looked at my Sky subscription the other day. It's £80 a month. Yes. That's sort of 80, 800, 900 quid a year. But then we choose to have Sky or not? Uh, well, yes, yeah, sort of. But, you, you know, there's still a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily want to watch, but it's all there. You know, you're paying for it anyway. And there are a lot of, um, you know, local stations, there's the online content. It should be, I mean, it is very good value for money if they produce the goods and they've stopped producing the goods. Yeah, it's interesting. So. It's interesting. But after all these years of broadcasting, and you've written a couple of novels as well, <laughs> and you've done lots of things, but you said that stopping broadcasting was like a bereavement. It was really because it was such a way of life, and I loved the adrenaline. And as I say, I, everything I did, really, nearly everything I did, was live. And I'm a bit dreamy, so I can, you know, gaze off, start to gaze off into space if I'm not careful. But if it's a live program, you know, your adrenaline's flowing, and uh, there you are. And I used to have the earpiece, and you sort of feel for, for the time you're on on air, you're in charge. Everybody's depending on you. All these people have worked to produce the content, mm. and you've got to present it. And it's it's um, you know it's a, you it's a it. privilege. You miss I it. I do miss it. Yeah. Yes, I do miss it. Who was the best person you worked with? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, Michael Aspel was wonderful and capital. Lovely, yeah. generous-hearted person. David Jessel was a lovely writer. Worked with him on Out of Court. Um, Terry Wogan was a terrific laugh, a great fun, and yeah. much missed. You know, really, he, he made children indeed. It's not the same now. So, yeah, it's all those three, I think. You worked with some fantastic people. Yes. I mean, you really, really <laughs> did. So what happens next then, Sue Cook? Because, you know, you are... Answer, I read that your grandmother lived to 107, is That's that... right, yes. 107, yes. I mean... And my mother will be 103 on the 30th of August. Right. <laughs> so, we had a 102-year-old man in here the other day, and he was a Omaha Beach veteran, he was with Amazing. it. So, centenarians, the female side of the family. Yes. So, there could be a lot of Sue Cook left, a lot of living to do. <laughs> you set the bar rather high, I think. You know. <laughs> so, given that you may well have decades more... <laughs> Health. Well, <laughs> it, what next for Sue Cook? Oh, I don't know, maybe something, you know, everything's in my life's been a lily pad coming along, I'm paddling along and there's, there's a lily pad comes and you step onto that and you think, I don't know where I'm going to go next and another lily pad comes along and you step onto that. So I don't know what the next lily pad will be, but, you know, I've got my mother to look after who's 103, as I yeah. say, and I've got a grandchild, hopefully a few more, com coming down the line one day. And was all of this really an accident? Yes. I, really, I mean, are you really telling me that you've had this stellar career in broadcasting and none of it was ever planned? I always wanted to do well. I always wanted to have a good reputation. I wanted to do something well. I wanted, you know, when I was a, a girl guide, I had an arm full of badges, you know, <laughs> and at school I did all the AO levels I could manage to do. I do like achieving things, but I never thought I'd be a broadcaster. And advice to young people getting into broadcasting? Bring something to the table. Don't do a media course. Ah, don't do it. Because that's what everyone thinks they yes. need to do. Yeah. Do something completely different and bring it to the table. That's my advice. But you know what? I reckon that's good advice for politicians too. <laughs> do something different. Absolutely. Don't just do a PPE degree. <laughs> Suka, absolute pleasure to have fun. you on Talking Pines. Thank you very much.